Hi everyone. Hi Father. Hope you're doing well. I need to go upstairs and get my um, tablet and uh, then we'll begin. We're on chapter 13 of Matthew's Gospel. Some reason it doesn't seem as bright in here as it did last time. It's very dark outside, overcast. Oh, that could be it. Could just be any better light bulbs. But yeah, it is not, not the lights coming into the outside, it looks like. I think we've got this ready. Okay. So let's begin with the uh, parish prayer, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Out of all goodness, you have called us from the corners of the earth in order to form this community of faith in Chicago. You have blessed us with a living faith, so our faith this world may come to know you. Make us generous toward those who hunger, compassionate to those who suffer abuse, kind toward immigrants and refugees, merciful to those who sin against you. May we be true disciples of your Son, faithful stewards of your grace. Evangelize us who are strengthened by the gifts of your Holy Spirit, that our petitions may bear much fruit and give glory to your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Okay, um, the first thing is chapter 13, so we're going back into a teaching section um, of the Gospel. And, and this one is different than the others because this is all parables. So there's not as much, um, there's, there's not as much uh, teaching or, or actual lessons um, as it would be normally. Uh, and there's, uh, in this chapter 13, there's eight parables that we're going to go through. And uh, as they go through, uh, they, they're split into different categories. So there's, uh, I think it's two, three, and three, or one, one, three, and three. And then the, um, the parable is, it's always, we always make it sound like it's, it's new to uh, Christianity or to Christ, but it's actually a, an old, um, it's an ancient form of teaching that was used in the Old Testament in a couple of books of the Old Testament as well. 
So it's, it's not actually a new thing, uh, but parables themselves are, are a wide variety of things. So they can be very short. Uh, kingdom of God is like a mustard seed uh, that grows and invites the birds in the air, becomes the largest of shrubs. Or it can be a much longer uh, reality, such as the parable of the prodigal son, or what we have here at the beginning is the parable of the sower. And uh, most of the time, Jesus does not explain the parables, but uh, there are two that he does uh, explain in this chapter. I'm trying to get around that light. Um, so there are two that he explains in this chapter in particular, and uh, that's the first one. So we're, we're going to start with that and then move, our, move ourselves forward from there. Uh, get to the sharing the screen part. Okay. What happened to me last night? Screen. There we go. Get this out of the way as best I can. Okay. Parable of Sower, chapter 13. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parable. So this is the first time that he spoke by the shore. It's the same shore along Capernaum and that whole area that we talked about in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and Mark and Luke have this uh, kind of teaching much earlier. In fact, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Plain, which is the kind of uh, Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gets in the boat, so they're kind of sitting in there. So uh, this isn't the first time it's happened. He spoke in a length in parable, saying, A sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground where it hit little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit, a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. Whoever his ears ought to hear. The disciples approached him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus said to them in reply, because knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been granted to you, but to them it has not been granted. To anyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. From anyone who is not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because they look but do not see, and hear but they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, You shall indeed hear but not understand, you shall indeed look but never see. Gross is the heart of this people. They will hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. Uh, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Amen. I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. And the devil one, and the evil one comes and seals away what was sown in his heart. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has no root and lasts only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word, but then the worldly anxiety and the lure of riches choke the word, and it bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. So we'll just do that, um, that first parable. And uh, there is um, obviously there's already an explanation in there. I want to mention that the... Uh, parables that we have are, uh, the Hebrew word for this is mishal. So the Greek word is parable, uh, it comes uh, yeah, parabola, and then it comes into parable from, to English. Um, so the mishal is the, uh, is the kind of teaching that happens, and it's a regular teaching. We find it sometimes in Proverbs, 
We find it sometimes, as I said, in some of the uh, other prophets. Most of the prophets did not teach in this way, but we have the whole book of Proverbs of which there are many parables in there. So, the other thing I wanted to mention here is um, he sets up the, the um, kind of the seed that's being sown is, is the word of God, and he's, he's going to use that again when he comes to the next one, uh, but this time he's going to change what the, the seeds are, so then the seeds become not the word of God, but they could become the people of the kingdom, the children of God, or the citizens of the kingdom. Uh, and so when we get to the next one, it's, it's going to change somewhat. Now, the problem in the interpretation, and all of the, the, the three synoptic gospels have this parable, they have this interpretation. It's most probably uh, a parable of Jesus, uh, because it comes across all three gospels in almost the same way. The interpretation comes in, in exactly the same way. Um, the problem with any interpretation is a parable really, the richness of a parable is that it, it stands not for one thing to another, but one to many. And so the application is usually much more open-ended. It doesn't mean that there's not a singular, singular point, but rather that the, the way of applying the parable it is usually more open-ended. Jesus, in this case, seems to have applied the parable almost as an allegory. This is this, this is this, this is this. But of course, none of that in terms of the images or allegory of the parable is the point of the parable. Because the point of the parable is that someone who really hears the word and understands it is going to do something with the word in such a way to bear fruit. Uh, that fruit can either be giving glory to God or it can be uh, thankfulness, gratitude, stewardship, discipleship, evangelization, bringing in more people, whatever it might be. So, but there's, there's, responsibility to to receive the word of god requires responsibility those all the others who did not uh, bear fruit is because they took no responsibility for it or as they were letting the, the word of god into their lives they looked away and saw other things and we're going to see that looking away in another in another story entirely as we move further down in tonight's class Second parable, he proposed another parable to them, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a man who sowed good seed in this field. While everyone was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds all through the wheat and then went off. When the crop grew and bore fruit, the weeds appeared as well. The slaves of the householder came to him and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. His slave said to him, do you want us to go and pull them up? He replied, no, if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot the wheat along with them. Let them grow together until harvest, then at harvest time I will say to the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles for burning, but gather the wheat into my barn. The particular uh, weed that's being talked about here is Darnell. Uh, at least that's what the commentator uh, from the Catholic Commentary Series seems to think it is. And that's because Darnell is a, is a plant that um, its roots intermingle with the roots of other plants. And there was actually a law in, in, in Roman law that prohibited people from sowing darnel into fields because it would destroy the ability for other plants to grow. The one thing good about darnel is that it was used uh, for its fuel, for burning. So uh, that's what they think um, was the weed in particular here, although it's not mentioned, it, it was not listed in, in the Greek as darnel, it's just a weed. Uh, so the translation is accurate, but the um, the interpreter, the commentator thinks, well, this is probably the wheat that he is referring to. But the wheat itself doesn't really matter. Um, so going on in verse 31, he proposed, um, uh, let me stop with that. Uh, let's go back up to the, using the mouse, the mouse with the left hand doesn't work quite as well. Um, so the, uh, the parable of the weeds uh, among the wheat. So the sower is the same. The sower is going to be the son of man. Uh, that's what links these two parables together. So he's, in the parables, we're going to find that there's linkage between one to the other. So it's not just eight parables that are strung together, um, but there are things that link them together. It's almost like... Uh, if a comedian, if you were watching a comedian on TV or something like that, or at a comedy show, they, they 
talk about different things, but one thing leads to another. There's a kind of a link that they use to, to get their various topics out. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing in, in this particular chapter. Chapter 13, and the teaching in parables, he's using parables, but he's going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven in various ways. Uh, so as, as we come through, we, we see the, the various um, links that are coming in. And the first one is the, I'm sorry, I'm looking to make sure. And the first one is on uh, just the sower. And then he, now he brings the sower into the kingdom of heaven. Now we're going to have parables on the kingdom of heaven itself. And then, uh, of course, this, this is a question of, of really it's looking at the world. Because what he's doing is he's saying that the uh, evil one comes and, and people follow the evil way or they follow the good way, but they're mixed together and you're not going to pull them up. Uh, you're not going to be able to separate good from evil in this life. So <laughs> for the separation of good from evil. Okay, then we'll move to the next two parables, which is the parable of the mustard seed. Um, he proposed that another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, yet one full grown is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush and the birds of the sky come and dwell in its branches. He spoke to them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until the whole batch, of, the whole batch was leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. He spoke to them only in parables to fulfill what men said through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will announce what has lain hidden from the foundation of the world. Um, then, he's, uh, then comes the explanation of that first parable that we had, the explanation of the parable of the weeds. So I'm, I'm going to go through that and then get these three together here. Then dismissing the crowds, Jesus went into the house. His disciples approached him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. So he's given them four parables so far. The first one he explained right away. The next, uh, the next one he didn't explain and went on to two more. And then they come back and they got the other two. They must have got the other two, but now they want the, that other one, the weeds. So it's, uh, he said in reply, he who sows good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. So again, now the last, the first, that very first parable, we had different kinds of places where the seed fell. Um, and so you'd think that would be the world with the different kinds of places, but he was using those different kinds of places to reflect the different kinds of hearts that receive, receive the seed or the word of God. This time the field is the world and the good seed is sown, but also the weeds are the children, children of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all who cause others to sin and all evildoers. So you notice there's, there's two groups here. Those who cause others to sin, so those who tempt or trick others, and then all those who do evil themselves. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Then the righteous shall shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And again, whoever has ears ought to hear. So... Each time, that he, each time that he's making a specific point, he always concludes with that phrase, whoever his ears ought to hear. Uh, so we understand fully, if we, or if we don't, we should understand because he just explained it to us, and that means we should also then follow it. Okay, so I've got three parables so far. I'm going to um, take a moment and, and do a uh, whiteboard thing here to see what we've got. So what we have is we have the um, parable of the sower. Can you see this? Parable of the sower? Then What's that parable weeds wheat. And then mustard seed. Oops. Mustard. <laughs> Sorry about that. Seed. And then yeast. Horrible. Now, one of the things I want to point out here, and, and Luke does this all the time, but it's, it's done here by Jesus in, in Matthew's Gospel as well. 
So you've got the two, uh, two parables there, the mustard seed and the yeast. You notice one's a man and one's a woman. So Luke does this all the time to balance off and, and always trying to give us that balance that the kingdom is available to everybody. So the, the first parable is the, the, the word of God is being spread out there. Not everybody's going to receive it. Not everybody's going to accept it. Um, the second one is that in the midst of all, of, in, in the midst of those who receive it, they're also going to confront those who do not accept it, and they're going to have to live with them. But then, then we have two more people who are acting um, in terms of trying to give us an image of the reign of God. One is a man, and one is a woman. So there's a, there's always a balance there. Just as the weeds and the wheat are balancing uh, the first one, we see this mustard seed and the yeast balancing the second aspect of this, which is of course this. Both of those are talking about growth. One, of course, is talking about the growth of the kingdom. First and foremost, and, and this, is, this is important in a, in a parable as well, um, we, we have to understand when, when someone is preaching or someone is, is writing a book even, and they're using an image, they're using an image and they're not necessarily trying to give us scientific facts. So when Jesus says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, it is not the smallest of all seeds. It is a, it is a very small seed, but there are seeds that are smaller. Um, of course, he's not, he's not trying to give us a scientific fact. He's not trying to, to um, break it down. He's just, he's just giving us a sense. So, so this is a, a preaching style to say it's the smallest of all seeds. And then he says it becomes the largest of all bushes. It, it's not the largest of all bushes either. But the change in growth you know, from looking at a mustard seed and looking at a mustard plant, we see a, a great change. And, um, and so he, he's trying to emphasize that, that sense of growth. Uh, so it, it's uh, those who, who, who want to condemn Jesus for not being accurate. This is not about accuracy. This is about imagery. Uh, the other is the, the yeast. Uh, it, the woman needs the yeast in three measures of flour. If you, if you um, converted that into what we use today, you're talking about 60 pounds of flour. Um, she's making a lot of bread. She, she's, she's not making a loaf of bread. All the time when I, when I hear three measures of flour, I just think of three cups or something. And so I was thinking she's making a loaf of bread. The, the measures, the Greek, the, the word measures that they're being used refers to a, a measure that's like 20 pounds. So three measures of flour is 60 pounds of flour. That's an awful lot of flour. So um, you'll have one that's talking about a small thing that's growing. You have another thing that, that's talking about something that's growing, but it's growing because it's fermented. So the first one, the mustard seed kind of grows on its own. Uh, put it in the ground and, and it grows and it becomes this branch. But of course, the, the real point of the image is to try and get us to understand that as the kingdom uh, reaches its fulfillment, all kinds of people are going to make their home. So the birds of the air come and make their nests. It's, it's not meant for just these people. It's meant for many to come. So uh, the kingdom is open to a lot of people. So the, the idea of growth is a, is a different thing. The second one, the growth isn't happening automatically. It's being mixed in. And that the, the seed is, um, or the, the kingdom, is that which changes, which helps the world to change. So without the, without the yeast, the, the dough is not going to rise, and it's going to lay flat and be very heavy. But with the yeast, it's going to rise and grow and, and open up and, and, in a sense, give food to many. But one is, one is uh, in a sense, just happens, and the other one is uh, determined. So it's, it's being put in there. And we're going to see that going on again later on in the gospel. You also notice we're, we're coming close to where we are on our Sunday Masses. So we just did this a couple of weeks ago, these parables, and now um, we're, so we're coming very close to where we end up in the Sunday Gospels, and we're going to pass by them and move beyond the Sunday Gospels in, in this class. Okay, um, so that's what we got so far. I'm going to go back to where we were. Um, get back to here okay, did the explanation so 
more parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in the field, which a person finds and hides again, and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. So you see that one parable was just one sentence. Um, buried in the field, person finds, hides again, buys, sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea, which collects fish of every kind. When it is full, they haul it ashore and sit down to put what is good into buckets. For it is bad, they throw away. Thus it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. So he's gone back to that sense of the um, judgment at the end, which we found in that second parable of the wheat, the, the wheat and the weeds. Um, so he kind of concludes with that. And then he comes back to, do you understand all these things? So this whole time he's talking to his disciples, he's still in the house. Remember, he had gone into the house, he hasn't left the house. So he's still in the house talking to the disciples, and all these parables are specifically to them. You understand all these things? They answered yes, and he replied that every scribe who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings from his store both the new and the old. When Jesus finished these parables, he went away from there. So um, as soon as we have that, we have the end of the teaching section. We haven't gotten quite out of the chapter, but we've gotten to the end of the teaching section, and now we're going to see Jesus moving on again. Um, this, this line about the, the scribe who's been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household. Uh, when he's talking about the new and the old, he's not talking about just the New Testament and the Old Testament. What he's talking about is, is taking the teachings that we know from the past, and for us, that would be the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, and applying them in new ways, in new situations. So that uh, as you're trying to teach your children or grandchildren, or you come in contact with somebody, you remember this parable, you remember this teaching from Jesus, and you apply it in this situation. Uh, someone trying to lead us astray or are finding ourselves in the midst of, you know, if, if anything, the, the world we live in now is certainly very obvious, the weeds and the wheat, because there, there seems to be this conflict of good and evil, and nobody knows who's good or who's evil anymore because everything's being confused and all the roots are being ground together and um, trying to separate it out. Uh, and uh, the thing that has happened more than anything else is, Nobody knows what the truth is. <laughs> so even, even if something is presented as a fact, other people won't believe it's a fact. So we don't know, nobody seems to know what truth is anymore. And if you say this is true, somebody else will tell you it's not. And they will act like they know what they're talking about. So uh, we've lost that and we're just in this mess. And that's bringing the old into the new. Okay, I'm going to go back then to this um, other screen for a second and look at this whiteboard one more time. Because what we have is, so we have the mustard seed, we have the yeast. And then we have the, um, the treasure in the field. And then we have the pearl of great price. And then we have the the dragnet. The, and they used to call it a dragnet. Um, and I don't know if it's because of the television show or if it was simply because people don't know what a dragnet is and, and they just call it a net now. But a dragnet is a particular kind of way of fishing that you throw the net into the water. It's, they still do it. it that's how they uh, fish for tuna. Um, they, put the net between two boats basically or they put this net out with an, on one boat with a huge arm out on it and it just drags anything that it finds in the water, pulls it all up and then they figure out what to keep and what not to keep and 
And of course, the big question of dolphins being caught in the net with the tuna is because dolphins admit, a lot of times swim with the tuna. Uh, and, and you know, you don't want the dolphin, you don't want to kill the dolphin, but then it gets caught in that. So, so the drag net is it just takes in everything. So we've got these parables, and again, we see, we see them. We see them coming up in, in, in kind of, so these two are together, the two treasures. And notice that when he talks about the treasure, the first treasure, the treasure in the field, that's something that they just find. So the kingdom of heaven is something you just find. But when you find it, you have to sell everything you have in order to buy the field so you can have the treasure. Because if you just find it, you know it's not yours. But if you own the field, then it's your treasure. So you go out and you buy the field. But the, the guy has to sell everything he has. But he's just kind of walking along and, and it comes to him. This is, this, is, this is my treasure. The pearl of great price, however, is something that he's looking for. It's a merchant. He's looking for something of great price. He's looking for that exquisite pearl. And then when he finds the one truly exquisite pearl, he again sells everything he has. So the response of both of them is the same, but how they get to the understanding of the value of the kingdom of heaven is different. One, one simply stumbles over it, and the other one is, is on a deep search for it. And of course, that's pretty much the explanation of, of you know, people who, come to, people who come to faith, they come to faith either because they just got there or because they've been looking for something. Anyway, uh, and sometimes it's because they were looking for something the opposite of faith and then stumbled upon the treasure of faith. Of course, that's the song Amazing Grace, right? If you know the story of that song. So what we have in here is we actually have another uh, chiasm. And that is because these all kind of link together, but they kind of follow each other. And uh, I'm going to keep the parable of the sower off to the side because it, it doesn't specifically talk about the kingdom of heaven. Or as the others do. So we have A, B, B, C, C, A. So we have two that talk about the, the growth of the kingdom, we have two that talk about the value of the kingdom, and we have two that talk about judgment. And so again, they kind of fall back just like we did the other day or the second class or whatever it was, that we showed um, the chiasm previously, how the, how the things line up. Again, they, they do the same thing. So, so Matthew does this actually a couple of different times in, mm. in terms of the gospel. Right. I'm can, gonna, can you repeat what you just said, Father, to the, the value of kingdom to that so part? You have, a, a, is thought, a talks about judgment. So the parable of the weeds and the wheat and the parable of the dragnet. B talks about the growth of the kingdom of heaven, mustard seed and yeast. C talks about the value of the kingdom of heaven. So it's not quite A, B, B, A, but it's A, B, B, C, C, A. So they, you, they have them in couplets there. You have two Bs together, you have two Cs together, and then you come back to where you started from. That makes sense? Thank you. You're welcome. And I was going to stop just for a second to see if anybody has any questions at this moment, because uh, we're in, a, uh, in between chapters here, so. Well, I'm sorry that I, I walked in or I came in late, but oh, I wow. did have a question about parables, sure. because sure. one of the things that I thought about was Jesus was very articulate. Mm -hmm. And even though the parables seem to be stories that we kind of understand, but um, the way you have interpreted them, um, they are very complicated with, you know, some deep messages. So my wondering was, if, if Jesus was trying to explain um, specific ideas um, or lessons, mm -hmm. why didn't he simplify his message? Or am I the only one that thinks that, you know, he, he was so so very intelligent and articulate that even the way he spoke was very complicated in a way. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, it, 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 
it does and it doesn't. Um, if Jesus is, is being, um, if Jesus is obfuscating and making things sound more difficult than they are, it's simply because he's, he's in a political situation that he's being very cautious about. And we're going to see some of that come up next as, as he moves about. So remember, Jesus is trapped between Herod and the Romans and the temple. And so he's trying to present the, his message of, of God in an entirely new way. But he's got to be somewhat careful about how he presents it. At the same time, he needs to be clear enough. So I'm going to show you a couple of places as we go into the next two chapters here where he's very, very clear about what he's saying. Uh, and, and most of the Jewish people should be able to get that. It doesn't mean that they will. Uh, and the same thing with the parables. If you notice, the, many of the parables are seemingly easy enough to understand. The, the mustard seed or the, the woman with the yeast. Uh, others are a little bit more complicated, but those are the ones he explains. So those are, those are explained, the, the weeds and the wheat and the uh, parable of the sower. And, and we're given a reasonably good explanation. The ultimate teaching on that, of course, was that when he began this whole chapter was, he's saying, I'm teaching in parables. And, and the translation is, in, it's, it's a better translation in Spanish, but he, he's quoting Isaiah and he says, you will look in that sea. Uh, actually, the, the translation in Isaiah, if you go back, uh, and the Spanish translation is a more accurate representation of this, is you will look and look again but not see. Um, and you will hear and hear again, but not understand. And, and so this idea is that people keep going back and back to it. And, and part of that is there are some aspects of faith or some aspects of relationship with God. People, you know, they keep looking at, but they, they don't see it. Um, it's, and, and I'm sure that's, that's true of all of us at, at some point or another. I can think of things that I, I come into the church or I, I look at a parable. You know, I, I've been preaching on these on Matthew's gospel. I've been preaching for 30 something, 30 years, right? Or 38 years, I guess, something like that. Anyway, I've been preaching a long time. <laughs> so, um, but when Alan preached this Sunday, it was the first time that I thought of the, those two parables of the treasure in the field and the. Um, Merchants search for fine pearls, as the difference between them being one is simply stumbling upon it and one is looking for it. So, 30 years, um, every three years, you read the same gospel. So, at least 10 times I've preached on this gospel and never saw that. So, it's, it's that kind of thing that there are things in the parables or there are things in our faith or in our relationship with God that we keep doing and doing. And then finally, Oh, this is it. Um, and and that's, that's kind of a good sense when you talk about that you will look and look again. Uh, and we do see ultimately. And, and I think that's the difference. But there are those who, who keep looking at something or maybe stop looking at something because they just don't get it. And the difference between having a relationship with God and not having one is whether or not you're going to stop looking or stop seeing what God is offering. So does that help? Okay, then uh, we're going to move forward to the next chapter. Get to it. And do. Uh, let me. It's too complicated over here. <laughs> and, and, just move all, the, all your faces over here. It's easier to, to see the board then. Okay, so I have to get to the next page. Chapter 14. So now we're going back into the historic. Oh, wait, we didn't finish that, did we? Sorry. So, um, so we have Jesus moving around. So the first thing he does, he's, he's going to go to Nazareth. Now, in Luke's gospel, his first sermon is in Nazareth, and that's where the people of Nazareth reject him right away. Matthew's gospel has it happening later. Um, historically, we don't know what the actual journey or movements of Jesus were. And this is one of those places, 
since the Gospels are not in agreement, we're not sure if this happened right away or if it happened later, but the reaction is, is pretty much the same. So the rejection in 54, the rejection at Nazareth, he came to his native place and taught the people in the synagogue. They were astonished and said, where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother named Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not his sisters all with us? Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and in his own house. And he did not work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. So a, a couple of things on this, uh, apart from the whether or not it's, it's at the beginning or, or at this point in the ministry, the, the first thing is their astonishment, but their astonishment did not lead to faith. It leads to rejection. The last time we saw the astonishment, it, it led to faith. Um, but at least they were astonished because when he preached last to the Pharisees, they were not happy at all. Um, the second is, the again, we, we have to go back to the Greek and, and then back to the Hebrew from for its original understanding because this whole sense of relationship, Greek... Um, Hebrew does not have a word for uh, cousin. They, they basically, the word is, is any relative is called a brother. Anyone, any close relative is called a brother. So they don't have a word for cousin or in-law or something like that. They're just all brothers and sisters. So when we talk about brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, we're actually talking about Jesus' cousin. Uh, since Hebrew doesn't have a word for it, the Jewish disciples who were writing in Greek, all, you know, although they were writing in Greek, they had this Jewish mentality, so they took the Jewish word and translated it into Greek. And so again, that, that translation would be brother, but um, that's, not, that's not the understanding. And so when it comes out of the Greek, it comes back as brothers, and, and this causes the confusion in terms of um, you know, between Protestants and Catholic, did Mary have other children or not? Or did Joseph have another family before he took Mary as his wife? Uh, which is a whole nother valley rick of things to, to talk about. Uh, but let's, let, let me um, kind of give you the, you know, we all know the Catholic teaching that Jesus did not have other brothers and sisters. And Mary was a virgin and remained a virgin. So how does the gospel get off with saying uh, his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, other than a mistranslation of the word. And when someone comes up to you and says, well, no, the gospel says he had brothers and sisters, um, then you can go to them and say, okay, if he had brothers and sisters, Jesus is on the cross in John's gospel. And John's gospel is the one many Protestants love to quote from because that's the one that says, God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. So Jesus is on the cross in John's gospel. He sees Mary and he sees his disciple John, and he says to Mary, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother, and from that moment on, John took Mary into his home. If he had other brothers, why would he have to give his mother to one of his disciples? Why wouldn't one of the other brothers or sisters take care of his mother? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a basic question, and, and of course, he didn't have others, and that's why John took care of the Virgin Mary, because there were no other brothers or sisters. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of your, your basic answer. Here's, here's, here's the translation issue, and fine, we all don't know Greek, so we don't know how to respond to that, but the, the more obvious answer is, let's go to the gospel then, since this is in the gospel, let's go to the gospel and say, well, why would Jesus bother to give his mother away to one of his disciples when he had brothers and sisters to take care of her? That makes no sense at all. So, uh, there we go. And the second thing I wanted to point out there is, is he did not work many mighty deeds there. Um, he didn't say he didn't work any. He didn't work many. And notice it was because of their lack of faith. So if we go back and look at the miracles that had happened, uh, some of them from a distance, right? And, and we're actually going to come up to a couple more miracles that are happening from a distance. All, every time a miracle happens, Jesus talks about the person's faith. He gives, them the, he gives them the miracle because of their faith. When the Pharisees come and ask for a miracle, or 
in Luke's gospel, when, you know, or, um, you know, Herod wants a miracle, he won't give it to them because they're not asking out of faith. They're not asking out of their need or out of their faith. Um, they want him to prove something. So they have no faith in him. But everybody who comes and, and has faith, they receive what they need. So um, he does work mighty deeds there. He just doesn't work as many because the people there aren't showing him any faith. So, okay, now we'll go to 14. So now we're going to go to Herod. Um, and the story that we're going to get with the death of John the Baptist is, is told with more detail in Mark. And as, as I mentioned before, every time Mark has the same story as Matthew and Luke, Mark always has more detail in it. Um, so, and, and that's, one of the, that's one of my counterpoints when people say, well, Mark was written first because it's shorter. Um, you know, if you're writing the story shorter, or if you're retelling the story, uh, you don't usually take out the details, you usually add them in. So Mark adding in details that Luke and Matthew don't have doesn't, you know, kind of points to the fact that maybe he didn't write last, he may have written se second. Um, because there's no reason to take out some of these details or there's no reason to necessarily add them in um, other than you, you know something about this. And again, Mark's primary source for the gospel, it looks like, was Peter. And Peter was there all the time. So if anybody had the inside track on the details, it would have been Mark. Okay, at the time of Herod the Tetrarch, and again, we in London will call him King Herod. This is not King Herod from Jesus' birth. This is his son. So when Herod the Great, who is the king with, that uh, tried to kill Jesus, when Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four parts, which is why this Herod, one of his sons, is called the Tetrarch. So there's Herod Antipas and Herod Philippus. And, and Philip, um, the other Herod, is also a Tetrarch. So the kingdom was divided into four sections. And um, three of the sons ruled different sections, and then Jerusalem was, was ruled over by the Romans. So at the time, Herod the Tetrarch, who kind of took care of that western end of the Sea of Galilee, where Nazareth and all that is, heard of the reputation of Jesus he, and said to his servants, This man is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. This, that is why mighty powers are at work in him. Now, there is no evidence anywhere in the gospel or elsewhere that John the Baptist did any kind of mighty deeds or miracles or anything like that. But um, Herod isn't saying that he did miracles when he was alive, but because he was killed and raised from the dead, that is why the mighty powers are at work in him. So, so this resurrection gives him more power, you know, gives him the ability to make these mighty powers work within him. So now we're going to get into the story of the death of John the Baptizer. And in, again, in Mark's Gospel, this is kind of, after Jesus sends the disciples on mission, this is kind of an aside until they get back. Uh, that's not the case in Matthew's Gospel. It's just put here as Jesus is kind of kicked out of Nazareth. Then they put the story in because he's in Herod's territory. Now Herod had arrested John, bound him. So we're going to go back in time. So we had the kind of, this is what Herod's thinking today. Let's go back and... and Give you the background of the story. Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, for John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. So Herodias left her husband Philip, who was Herod's brother, and went and married Herod. Now the only time that was legal in, in uh, the king in Israel was if the brother died. Philip was very much alive. Um, so Basically, we're, we're having family issues here. So, although he wanted to kill John, he feared, feared, filled, feared the people, for they regarded him as a prophet. But at a birthday celebration for Herod, the daughter of Herodias performed a dance before the guests and delighted Herod so much that he swore to give her whatever she might ask for. So, at this point, Mark adds up to half his kingdom. And uh, Mark makes it a little bit more clear that the dance was somewhat seductive. And it mentions that it's the daughter of Herodias, not the daughter of Herod. So this could be the daughter by his brother Philip. Maybe there's someone else involved. Um, but Herod, as he lusted after his brother's wife, also lusts after his brother's child. Um, to give her whatever he, she might ask for. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. 
The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and the guests were present, he ordered that it be given. And, and again, Mark included that the birthday celebration included uh, many of the heads of the kingdom, many of the important people in the kingdom. Uh, and he had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in a platter and given to the girl who took it to her mother. His disciples came and took away the corpse and buried him, and they went and told Jesus. So again, those are the disciples that went and asked Jesus uh, that John had sent them to ask, are you the one who is to come? And now they've come and tell Jesus that John has died. So when Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. So we're going to get to the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Five loaves and two fish. This miracle story, um, the details of the miracle story, are told the exact same way in all four Gospels. This is the only miracle that, that happens this way. Um, that it's told exactly the same in all four Gospels. Usually in one Gospel or another, there's, there's some kind of distinction. You know, Luke may give the person a name, or Mark gives the blind man a name, Bartimaeus. There, there's, you know, where Luke has ten lepers, Matthew has two, uh, that kind of thing. There's, there's some differences in some of these miracles. This one is told exactly the same in all four. If it's told exactly the same in all four, this must have been a defining miracle for the church. It, it's one that the, the community of believers would not accept otherwise, you know. Uh, we're not going to accept that there are two popes, so we're not going to accept that, you know, there's, that there's no Holy Spirit. This, this is a defining moment. So this miracle is a defining miracle for the church. And it's defining primarily um, because of the, the kind of the, what happens in this miracle is, is different than other miracles. And the second thing is that it is reflective of the Eucharist itself. And John makes that point very clear because John doesn't have the uh, institution of the Eucharist in the Last Supper. He has the washing of feet, and then he goes on to a long discourse, but he doesn't talk about Jesus breaking the bread and sharing the cup. Everything there, all the theology on the Eucharist in John's Gospel is put into this story. So chapter 6 of John's Gospel is a, is a Eucharistic theology laid out for us, and that whole sense that we have to receive the, the body of Christ, we have to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, that all comes from John. Um, and it's all based on this story. So this story is the miracle itself, but also the, the Eucharistic underpinnings. And we'll see that in a couple of different ways. Even here, this story doesn't have all that theology in it, but there are, there's the underpinnings of Eucharist in here as well. So let's go back to the beginning here. And so he disembarked and saw the best crowd. So this is where the, the story begins, and, and the line is the same, but it's said in different, in, in different ways between Mark and Matthew and Luke. Uh, so when he, when he crosses the, the lake or crosses the sea or uh, goes to a deserted place by himself, um, they have different reasons for him to go, but they all have him landing in the same place. They all have him landing and see a vast crowd. His heart is moved with pity for them. Mark adds, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Um, and he cured their sick. Uh, Luke adds that he taught them a long time. So here, it looks like he's spending all his time curing their sick, and it becomes evening, whereas Luke and Mark make it sound like he taught them a long time, and it got to evening. Uh, but either way, it gets to evening. And um, the, the, again, the disciples approached him and said, it's a deserted place, dismiss the crowd so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Uh, same line used everywhere, same line Jesus says, there's no need for them to go away, give them some food yourselves. Same response in every gospel. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. So the only difference is that I think it's John's gospel. Um, Andrew mentions there's a boy here who has five loaves and two fish. Um, other than that, it's the five loaves and two fish um, all of the other three Gospels say we have it as if the disciples had it on the side, you know, for their lunch or whatever. Um, John mentions it, or uh, Andrew says that they found a boy who has five loaves and two fish. But 
Um, and then the, a couple of them add, but what does that about with so many? Then she said to them, bring, bring them here to me. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves. So again, that's the same in all the gospels. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowd. So when we get to the Last Supper, what does Jesus do? He takes the bread, looks up to heaven, says the blessing, breaks the bread, gives it to the disciples. Same pattern. Um, the difference here is that after he gives them to the disciples, they in turn give it to the crowds. So that the, the sense of Eucharist, if we, we want to take that further, is to say the sense of Eucharist is the disciples receive and now they, they pass it on. Remember the line earlier, what you have received as a gift, give as a gift. Um, they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over. So again, same line everywhere. Picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets full, same amount everywhere. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, same number, not counting women and children. So exact same, exact same story, all four Gospels. 12 wicker baskets, the most obvious explanation is you have 12 tribes of Israel, or you have 12 apostles. Uh, or, or just 12 is, is a complete abundance. So if, if, you know, in order to have a community, you have 12 people or you have the 12 tribes, then the 12 wicker baskets means that everybody has enough to eat. Uh, so counting the 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So even at, even at a minimum number of a family of three, you're talking 15,000 people. Um, Probably more women than, than men. And, you know, you go to church, you see more women than men. Uh, and women are going to usually have more than one child. So, <laughs> there's, you know, especially in those days. So, they, you know, you're not talking about 15,000. You might be talking about 17, 18, or 20,000 people uh, is what we're looking at in terms of people who had gathered for this. So they were all there. And, again, from there the differences start to go on in terms of what that means. And, of course, John has, uh, John has Jesus leave because he thinks they're going to try and make him a king after this miracle. Um, the other is the Gospels do not have that presumption in there, so they don't mention that. But this whole thing goes on. It's all the same. Uh, problem with this miracle is that uh, some, go, some who want to be anti-Christian or want to diminish Christ uh, will look at this and say, you know what, this is just a, a blow-up of Elijah's miracle, or of Elisha's miracle. Um, this is just a reflection of what, you know, the manna from heaven. So they use those three stories. So you, the story of Elijah, Elijah, after he, he called down the, um, the drought, he finds this widow, widow and... Um, she has a son, and he wants him, her to prepare something for him to eat. And she says, I've only got a, a little bit of flour, a cup of oil, and when, you know, I was going to make some cakes for myself and my son, and then we're going to die. And then Elisha says, you, you surely won't die. And the three of them live for a year on this until the rains come again. So the three of them live on a cup of oil and a pound of flour, and they, the, the oil doesn't go dry. The, the flour never um, ends up empty. The basket of flour never ends up empty, and they live for a year. The Elisha story is Elisha taking. Uh, Elisha has a, a dozen men with him, um, and they're hungry. And so Elisha takes ten loaves and, and feeds this dozen men or a hundred men. I think it's a hundred men. So he feeds a hundred men with this this ten loaves. Um, so he breaks each loaf into. 10 pieces, whatever. Uh, the manna story, of course, is, is the people are crying out for something to eat, and God provides this manna from heaven, which is this um, kind of core frost that just covers the ground every morning. If you get up early enough, you can pick it and, and actually eat it. If you don't get up early enough, then it, the sun evaporates it. But the, it lasted all the time the Israelites were in the desert. So the, the three stories, the three miracles that they say, well, this is just the, the Christians making it sound better, you know, making Jesus sound better than the other guys. Um, the manna story was life and death. 
and it was the life and death of the whole tribe of Israel, the whole, the whole people of Israel, all of God's people dying in the desert after he had freed them from Egypt. Uh, and this story came, comes day after day after day until they eat the fruit of the land of the promised land. They, they eat the uh, manna in the desert and they don't stop eating. It doesn't stop until then. Uh, an entirely different thing, an entirely different thing, entirely different reason. And while it's a miracle or, or while people call it a miracle, the hoarfrost was not unknown. Moses saw it and knew exactly what, what it was because he had lived in the desert himself and then said, God gives you this. So it's, you know, basically looking at the rain, it's been, it's been a dry week and it rains today and we say, God gave us the rain. <laughs> um, it happened and, and so we, we ascribe it to God. And that's, that's not quite the same thing. The Elijah story, again, is, is kind of a life and death story but it's with just the three people, and it's really just to cover them through for the famine, for the, the drought. The Elisha story, they're hungry. This story, none of these people are in danger of dying. You know, they, they might faint on the way, I guess, if it's hot, but they're really not in danger of dying. They've only been there all day, um, and usually people don't die of hunger after a day. It takes a little longer than that. So, um, the, just the reason behind the miracle. In the Elijah story, the woman was basically asking for help. In the Elisha story, they were looking for something to eat. These people weren't looking for a miracle, they didn't ask for a miracle. So the, uh, this idea that Christians somehow just took the other stories and made ours sound better, it doesn't, it doesn't hold water, it doesn't hold up to, to what's really happening here. The second is the, the sheer numbers involved. If, if we wanted to do better than Elisha, all we had to do was do 500 people instead of 100 people. But we didn't do 500, we did 5,000 men, and then they added women and children on top of it. So the sheer numbers involved are, are just huge, they're tremendous. And the fact that it goes across every gospel means that it, it, it was a, it would, it would be like if, we had a preacher today trying to tell us that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Nobody would believe that because everybody believes that Jesus rose from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, as St. Paul says, we're just stupid. Uh, but if he rose from the dead, then we have power over death. So, um, you know, the Christian community demanded this story in a sense. All the Gospels tell it, and they all tell it the exact same way. And we know that John did not copy the other people because his gospel is entirely different than the other three. You know, we might be able to make a case that Matthew and Luke copied Mark or Mark and Luke copied Matthew or what, however you want to do it. But even when they copy each other, they tell different parts. They have different details. The details are the same. This is too important of a story for it to simply be made up or forced in there or to make Jesus look good. This is essential to the ministry of Jesus Christ, essential to our understanding why he's the son of God. Immediately afterwards, we're gonna to get to walking in water. And this happens in the gospels as well. Again, the details in the other gospels are all, they're different. So again, we know that he, you know, the story of walking on water is, is consistent in the gospel, but all the details are different. Not like the feeding of the 5,000. So then he made the disciples get into the boat, proceed him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Normal thing for Jesus to do in Luke's gospel, but he, um, it's not as mentioned as often here in Matthew's gospel. When it was evening, Jesus was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, so somewhere between three o'clock and five o'clock in the morning, uh, he came toward them, walking on the sea. And, and again, the, the miracle of walking on the sea, so the only similar miracle in the Old Testament is the parting of the sea by Moses. Uh, but here he's walking on the sea. Uh, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. And again, um, 
either you're talking, either you're dealing with them as uh, very simplistic people, which is a possibility, um, or you know, if, if I saw something out in the distance and I wasn't sure what it was, and I thought it was somebody walking on the sea or whatever, that that would be, you know, I would know that's my eyes playing tricks on me. But if twelve of us all see the same thing, then you know, and that's what's happening. The twelve disciples, or, or whoever many were actually in the book, because there could have been more, um, they all saw it. They all saw it, and so the number of witnesses to this is is far greater. Um, so they cried out in fear. And once Jesus spoke to them, "Take courage, it is I." Now that line, uh, first of all, the, the, the "take courage." The second most common phrase in the, in the Gospels is, be not afraid. So it's translated here as take courage, but the translation it was, the Greek it actually can be easily translated, have no fear, or be not afraid. So take courage and desire, do not be afraid. So the, the line is, do not be afraid. And then the other line here, it is I. That actually, the way the Greek lines up, and you can say it is I, that's one way of translating it, but the other way of translating it would be I am. And if Jesus is saying I am, then he's calling himself God. That is God's name. I am who am. So remember Moses at the burning bush, tell me what your name is so I can tell the people I am who am. Um, and, and the Greek is actually the reflection of I am. So it's being translated here differently, uh, but it shouldn't be. It should be translated directly as I am, because this is that point I said that we're gonna see Jesus be, being much clearer about who he is. This is one of those times. He's, he's actually calling himself using the name of God. So Peter said to him in reply, Lord, and again, so he doesn't call him master, he doesn't call him teacher, he calls him Lord. Um, so if it is you, command me to come to you in the water, Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, and, and the way the Greek is written, it, it's more like the wind, um, the wind caught his attention. So we're translating it to, to kind of make, make it nice. We say, when he saw how strong the wind was, but more accurately, it would be to say, the wind caught his attention and he became frightened. Um, so, and, and, and the reason I, I point that out is, is, is to say, basically, he turned his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink. When he's looking at Jesus, he's on the path, he can walk on the water. But when he turns his head somewhere else, Jesus isn't in sight, he begins to sink. And that's a, that's a huge change. Um, so, uh, it, it, it's, it's an important point in terms of understanding how this works. So uh, that would be the better translation of that as well. When he saw the, how strong the wind was, he became frightened, beginning to sink. He cried out, and he cries out, Lord, save me. So again, going back to the Lord, but now save me. Uh, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. So he couldn't have been very far away. Stretched out his hand unless Jesus kind of like raced over there, walking on the water. Uh, but more likely, he was, he was, very, he was very close but he turned his face away from Jesus. Um, said, oh, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, so, um, and, and, and again, this is, this, is the, this is the difference between those who get miracles and those who don't. Miracles come because of faith. And so uh, he had enough faith to get out of the boat, but he didn't have enough faith to keep his eyes on Jesus. So why did you doubt? Why did you turn away? After they got in the boat, the wind died down. Now, remember, the last time they tried crossing the lake and there was a strong wind and Jesus was asleep in the back and then they woke him up because, you know, Lord, save us, we're, we're going to drown. Uh, this time he gets into the boat and the wind dies down. So the last time when he calmed the wind by just telling it, you know, to stop, they were amazed and asked, who is he? This time, those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So now they, you know, it just is, is that kind of counterbalance with Peter. You didn't have enough faith to keep your eyes on me, but the others, I walk into the boat and they all know that I'm the son of God because of what happens when I get in the boat. So 
again, it, it counterbalances that faith and, and exactly how that all plays out. It could have been exactly this way. It could be something else. But uh, the, one of the things that Matthew's highlighting here, literally, you know, in terms of uh, literature, is he's trying to counterbalance these, these aspects. Okay. Um, then healing. So they cross to the other side and they come to the land at Gennesaret. So Gennesaret is to the southeast and um, that's a pagan territory. Um, so it's non-Jewish territory. When the men of that place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel on his cloak. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage? If I only touch the tassel of his cloak? So that they might only touch the tassel of his cloak and his money has touched it, were healed. So what the woman took from Jesus, he now in a sense is freely giving. All they have to do is touch his cloak and they're healed. Uh, which is uh, kind of, again, a great, great counterbalance to the story of the woman who had the hemorrhage. So let me, again, stop and give you a chance if there's any questions in chapter 14. Questions from anybody? Do I have it so you can unmute yourselves? I think so. No, thank you. Okay, no questions? Good. Okay, then you, do you want to do chapter 15? It's 8.15. Um, I finished 15 with the Spanish group last night. Uh, you want me to continue or you want to stop? Continue? Sure, you can continue. I, okay, that'd be great. Then let's no move on. No one else is talking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's move on to 15. Because that'll really keep us in the same place. Okay, keep me from getting confused. I missed something here. Let me try this again. Oh, okay. Over there. Sorry. Okay. Tradition of the elders. Then, the, then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So as far as we know, he's still in, he's still in Gennesaret, right? Um, so they come over and say to him, uh, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat a meal. And again, Mark tells more details. When he, when he tells this story, he, he has more details in it. Jesus said to them and replied, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So uh, you know, so again, there's this counterbalance, but this time Jesus is the, the force doing the counterbalancing. They come forward, why do you say disciples break tradition of the elders? And Jesus says, why do you break the commandment of God? Uh, for the sake of tradition. For God said, and, and again, this is a, the, the story is told differently between Mark and Matthew. Um, Let's focus in here on Matthew. He said to them, um, for God said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses father or mother shall die. But you say, whoever says to father and mother, any support you might have had for me is dedicated to God. Korban is the word in Hebrew. Um, uh, dedicated to God need not honor his father. You have nullified the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So um, when the when this translated here is dedicated to God, uh, the more accurate translation would be dedicated to the temple, is, is given to the temple. Uh, and I think the translators here use dedicated to God because uh, it would offend us to think that people were given to the temple, you know, that the temple was more important than God, um, or that somehow, but for the Jewish people, the temple is God's, you know, footstool. His throne's in heaven, but his, his feet rest in the temple. So um, they, they see the temple as a direct connection to God. Uh, so, that, as I said, in English, they translated it this way. In Spanish, they kept it as dedicated to the temple. Uh, and, and the Greek would be dedicated to the, to the temple. And the idea behind this, of course, is, is this is, you know, you'll hear this line from, from uh, ministers and priests and all kinds of people, um, not just the gospel of prosperity people, but all kinds of preachers will talk about what you need to give to the church what you need to give to God, uh, you know, and, and particularly money is more than anything else. Uh, and, you know, the, some go as far as the, the, you know, what you, you know, you give to me, you give to the church, so God will give you more. Uh, and, and Jesus is, is really 
sending a warning to all of us to be careful about preaching like that. First and foremost, uh, the commandments stand before anything else. And so honor your father and mother, in, in Jewish mentality, honoring your father and mother included taking care of them when they were elderly. So that meant taking care of them when they got sick or taking care of them if they could not work anymore and didn't have savings of their own, that you, that you needed to take care of your father or mother. Um, and so, and there was no way around that. So honoring your father and mother is not just a matter of not mouthing off to them when you're young. It's also making sure that they're cared for when they're elderly. Um, and then the, the Pharisees allowed, again, in, in terms of um, finding loopholes in the law, saying, okay, you, you know, if you give the money to the church, then, and you don't have the money to take care of your parents, that's okay because you gave it to the temple, you gave it to, you gave it to God, you dedicated it to God. And, and God's more important than your father or mother. Uh, you know, when we get to that, we, we fail to understand that God, that our parents are God's gift to us. And so that God's first gift to us is our parents. And so if you do not honor the gift, you do not honor the giver. Uh, you may not like the gift, but you need to honor the gift and honor the giver. Um, so to say I'm going to honor the giver, I'm going to honor God, but not honor the gifts he gives me, that's, that's nonsense. Um, and basically, that's just Jesus is saying that you have nullified the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And the reason I point that up about the temple is because, again, the, Matthew is very clear at the very beginning. Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city where the temple is. The temple is the big money maker. It's like you go to St. Peter's in Rome, there's all kinds of things being sold there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's said the surest place to lose your faith is at St. Peter's in Rome. And the reason is because you see all this other stuff going on, people selling all kinds of things, selling a million different images of the Pope and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it can disgust you if you, know, you look at all that, all the commercialism. And so, that, but that was the temple in Jerusalem, had all of that going on and more. Um, and, and so that's, that's where they're coming from, and they're trying to make sure that the temple is honored. That's, their biggest complaint with Jesus is that he did not care enough about the temple. And the temple was the, foot, was the footstool of God. Um, and Jesus is trying to show them that, that God is not sitting with you're connecting again, you're back. Thank God. Okay. I lost you all for a second. Um, now I have to get you to the side here. How do I do that? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Exit full screen. Let's try sharing the screen again. There, that worked. Okay, sorry. I did never took a course in Zoom, so. Um, so hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy to you about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, human precepts. So again, these, these are, are human rules that they made up. Uh, you know, it's the same thing like with the fasting laws in the church. They're, they're church laws. They're, they don't come from God. They're church laws. God simply said, when you fast, wash your face and comb your hair. <laughs> uh, he didn't tell us, you know, when we had to fast or how many times or how many days or, or what it consists of. Uh, those, are all, those are all things that we just choose to, to make. Uh, and if they interfere with divine word, then we, we have a problem. So he, so he summoned the crowd and said to them, hear and understand. And then, so he's going to, now he's going to go back to the original question. So the original question was that the disciples do not wash their hands. And of course, one of the reasons for washing the hands is you do not want to be defiled by, you know, Gentiles may have touched this food. And so don't eat it until after it's washed. Or you bought it in a Gentile market, make sure you, you know, Wipe the dust off of your shoes so you don't carry Gentile dust into your house. Um, so now Jesus is going to go back to that question. So his first thing was to attack them 
for making up rules that, that are against God's law. But now he's going to go back and actually answer their question. It is not what enters one's mouth that defiles that person, but what comes out of the mouth is what defiles one. Then his disciples approached him and said, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? And it probably would be better translated as, you do know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said. Jesus said in reply, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. So he's now saying that the Pharisees were not necessarily planted by his heavenly Father, they, because they're teaching human doctrine, human precepts. Let them alone. They are blind guides, or, and again, the old translation was, they are blind leading the blind. They are blind guides. If a blind person leads a blind person, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter said to him in reply, explain this parable to us. Jesus said to them, are even you still without understanding? Do you not realize that everything that enters the mouth passes into the stomach and is ex expelled into the latrine? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Doesn't mean it won't make you sick. Remember, Dr. Fauci said, wash, wash your hands before you, when you come into the house and um, wash your food. But, um, but it, just because it makes you sick doesn't mean it makes you impure. There's a difference between being sick and being impure. And, and Jesus is reminding us that, that sin doesn't come from outside to inside to us. It comes from within. It's what we're looking for or what we're doing. Okay, moving forward. So he's still traveling around. He's still, he's still in that area. Um, but now he's gonna now he's gonna move. So then Jesus went from that place, Gennesaret, and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And if you remember in the very first class when I was giving you the map, Tyre and Sidon is along the sea coast of the Mediterranean Sea. So he's he's gone from around the Sea of Galilee and up to the Mediterranean. Um, so th there was a lot of movement here, but we don't we don't actually have movement in terms of it just kind of happened. So part, part of that though is when people ask him about, you know, when Jesus, when did the disciples learn all the things they needed to learn? Well, when they're walking from place to place, Jesus is probably talking to just them and teaching them various things. So, you know, this is, this is a long journey to go from one end of the Sea of Galilee to the Mediterranean. It could have been at least three or four days, if not a week to get there. So they're in the region of Tyre and Sidon, near the Mediterranean Sea, and behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. That line, um, we, we've seen it before. We, uh, it's most famous in Mark's Gospel. That this is the cry of Bartimaeus, Son of David, have pity on me. Um, of course, so we got three things here. Have pity on me is um, his heart was moved with pity before when he saw the crowds. And then secondly, Lord. So she's not calling him teacher. She's not calling him ma uh, master. She's not calling him rabbi. She's calling him Lord. She's giving him true homage. Son of David is the title of the Messiah. So um, she's making sure that, you know, she's calling him. She's giving him all due homage, calling him Lord and, and calling him Messiah. And asking, and asking for pity on her, but to heal her daughter. So the pity for her is because it would heal her. To heal a daughter would be to have a pity on her. It would, would soothe her pain. So my daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not say a word in answer to her. His disciples came and asked him, send her away. And again, asked him, it should be, his disciples came and said to him, send her away, for she keeps calling out after us. Jesus had replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now you know that's a lie, right? Because we just had Jesus taking care of all the Gentile people in Gennesaret. So he just cured a whole bunch of sick people, not of the house of Israel. But he is trying to get rid of her. So he's trying to get rid of her and get her out of the way because she's making him look bad. She's calling out after him and he's not responding. You know, so it's, it just, it's just embarrassing. So he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage. So, and, and again, um, the... Uh, we just simply say to the homage, she knelt down before him. So again, we saw this with um, the uh, centurion, I think it was, uh, knelt down, or the, uh, the blind man knelt down before him. 
and said, Lord, help me. So Jesus had replied, now, now here comes the uh, first time we see Jesus insulting someone who is not a Pharisee or a scribe. It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. And of course, this, this was um, uh, the Jewish mentality toward the rest of the world where they were, they were dogs. We are the chosen people. We have this covenant with the one true God, and you are heathens who, who worship all kinds of things, uh, but you don't know God. So they, they had this, you know, exalted view of themselves because of the covenant of Abraham. It's not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. And then she said, please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And we just saw that. We just saw Jesus taking care of all those sick people. Then Jesus said to him, replied, O woman, great is your faith. Remember I said miracles are always done with faith? Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. So again, we're talking about healing from a distance. Moving on from there, Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee. So now he's come back went up on the mountain and sat down there. Probably the mountain, the mountain of the Beatitudes in that um, unpopulated area between Bethsaida and um, Capernaum. So that area, one of those mountains, maybe the mountain of the Beatitudes, whatever, uh, sat down there. Great cop crowds came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the deformed, the mute, and many others. So if, if he had already talked there with the Beatitudes, uh, going back there, people would know the place, would know that it's a safe place to be, would know that there's grass to sit down, and that they could listen to him. But they came, again, bringing to him all those who were sick and many others. They placed them at his feet, and he cured them. The crowds were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the deformed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind able to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. Okay, um, here's... Here is the problem. The first time when it was, he went up for that mountain, if it, it's the Mount of the Beatitudes, because it's by the Sea of Galilee, those were Jewish people who came to him. They were coming from Capernaum and, and around the, the Jewish town settling there. These aren't Jewish people because they it wouldn't have said they glorified the God of Israel. They would have just said they glorified God. So these are the Canaanites, these are the people from Lebanon, these are the people from Syria. These are, because again, um, Capernaum is on a Roman road, so it it's, divides the territory between what is normally, what is traditionally Jewish territory, Herod's territory, his brother Philip's territory, and Gentile territory, or, or the territory of Syria and, and Lebanon. So, um, he must be talking about non-Jewish people who brought this mute, the sick. And of course, you know, the people in Nazareth, again, this is the counterbalance. The people in Nazareth uh, were, um, were astonished and denied him. These people are amazed and they glorify the God of Israel. Second feeding. So if these are, the, if these are not Israelites, if these are not Jewish people, the feeding of the 4,000. So we had the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication of five loaves and two fish. Jesus summoned his disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd. So it's the same crowd. But they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. So, again, if they, they must have had something to eat the first two days because they probably took stuff with them, but there are so many people to take care of that it took them three days to, to get through everything. I do not want to send them away hungry for fear they may collapse on the way. The disciples said to him, Where could we ever get enough bread in this deserted place to satisfy such a crowd? Now, this isn't that long after the multiplication of loaves, so you'd think they would have remembered, but all we had to do is find a couple of loaves and fish and he could do something with it. Um, but their, their first thing is, well, where can we find it? Where can we get enough bread? Um, and part of that, of course, is that they're, they're looking at a Gentile crowd and thinking, well, why do we, you know, what are we gonna give to them? <laughs> Uh, so Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and a few fish. So again, they were very specific last time, five loaves, two fish. And that's it's the same in everything. Seven and a few fish. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. Same Eucharistic 
uh, lineup. Took the loaves, gave thanks, broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples, gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, but these are not Jewish people. Why are they eating and they're satisfied? They were all ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets full. Those who ate were 4,000 men, not counting women and children. And when he had dismissed the crowds, he got into the boat and came to the district of Magadan. So uh, the, the story here is very much like the other story, except now we're not dealing with a Jewish crowd, we're dealing with a Gentile crowd. We're dealing with the crowd of the Canaanite woman. So the very woman that he said, you know, my, my mission is only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's now taking care of all the people who don't belong to the house of Israel. And not only is he taking care of them, but he's taking care of them the exact same way that he took care of the Sorry about that, my, my screen fell apart on me. The computer jumped down. Uh, <laughs> I thought it, it's only my, my cell phone is. No, it's, it's the screen here. The, the whole computer stopped for whatever reason. Um, we gotta try and figure it out, figure that out. I'll leave that for uh, somebody tomorrow. <laughs> Friday or whatever. Let me get back to all of you. It's it's not it's not opening up the other thing. So up the share thing. And let's, uh, hopefully you have your Bibles with you. It lowered the uh, camera and everything. Everything went, everything went blank. So just let's finish it up because we're almost at the end of this. Um, we'll go back to the, to the book here. <laughs> So the story is almost the same, um, but this time it's to the Gentiles. It's not to the Jewish people. And, uh, and again, the seven uh, could be symbolic. Uh, there, are, there are the seven kingdoms surrounding uh, Israel. So it could be represented of the seven kingdoms. The, those who are around, surrounding Israel are also invited to participate in the kingdom. And if it's not that, then um, it's simply, again, this idea that there's a, a tremendous leftover, seven being a, a complete number, a perfect number, and therefore there's this leftover for everybody. There's enough for everybody, whoever needs it. Uh, and um, so, and when he had dismissed the crowds, he got into the boat and came to the district of Magadan, which again is a Gentile district. So we um, basically have this 15th chapter of Jesus going mostly into Gentile territory. So expanding his ministry, expanding his mission, and his sense of, of where the kingdom is being reached out to. With that, uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Uh, go ahead and feel free to ask them, because we're at the end of, of chapter 15, which is good. Any questions from anybody? I have a comment. Yes, Alice. Uh, I just find that the use of parables um, I like the, the style being, I find it non-threatening, the way Jesus delivers his message. And um, it's non-threatening in the sense that because of the use of imagery, I find that he really gives us the opportunity to let it sink in and see how it really fits into our lives. I think that's just how I see it. And that is, is mostly true in, in Matthew's gospel. In Luke's gospel, you'll find that the parables always have a thorn in them, always kind of punch at us a little bit. So, and, and that again is also part of the, the beauty of the parable is, yes, we get caught into the image, we get this non-threatening image, we get enticed into listening to the story, but then there's always this little poke at us, especially in Luke's gospel, the parables that are there. Um, not as much in, in Matthew's gospel. 
this, this chapter of parables in chapter 13, uh, the chapter of parables that we have really is a, a great set. But again, even, even they are calling us. So you've got the, the two, the beginning and the end, that they kind of look at the world around us. But then you've got the, the two that says, well, what are you producing? What are you doing for the kingdom of God? What are you, how are you growing? Or how are you seeing the kingdom of God growing in you? And then, of course, how do you value the kingdom of God? So they're, they're wonderful. They're, the stories themselves are non-threatening. But to reflect upon them means that we have to really think through our faith, which is, which is part of the strength of the parables, is they call us into more reflection than simply um, a teaching like or a line. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Sorry for that last minute <laughs> fall apart. Um, I think we're done for tonight. We'll start on chapter 16 on next Wednesday and keep moving along. We're actually doing very, very well. So there's 28 chapters, uh, we're at 16, and we're past the halfway point. And, and of course, we've, we've gone, gone through three of the teaching sessions. So there are five discourses, five primary discourses in Matthew's Gospel. We've done three of them so far. And uh, we're going to get into a little bit more of the, uh, of the conflicts between the Pharisees and, the, and Jesus. But we're also going to get now the, the response of the disciples. Uh, in Mark's Gospel, that is, that is uh, kind of like a primary theme in Mark's Gospel. And it's always a um, counterbalance between understanding and not understanding until they come to faith. Uh, Chapter 16, we're going to find Peter's confession of faith and how coming to faith moves them forward. So um, it's not as strong as uh, or strongly presented as it is in Mark's gospel. But again, we're, we're going to see the disciples moving forward in the conditions of discipleship as well. Okay, so 16, 17, 18 next time around, if we get that far. And again, thank you very much. I will see you next week if I don't see you on Sunday, right? Good night. Amen. Thank you. Uh, good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Everybody, good night.